All right. So, so today we have a special episode of The Left Wing. I am here with candidate for U.S. Senate from the great state of Maryland, Juan Dominguez. I'll be interviewing him today, talking about economic policy, maybe some social issues, and maybe even getting into why is Juan running for Senate in Maryland? It's something that I think a lot of our viewers have at least considered. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into all that. But first, Juan, thank you uh, for coming on the show today. Uh, would love to get started. I know one thing that we talked about recently on the left wing, which really I think will let you say a lot about your platform, uh, is the debate that's going on right now surrounding the actual economy versus the perception of the economy. Because by a lot of, you know, general standard economic metrics right now. We're seeing inflation start to return to normal levels. We're seeing very low unemployment, um, but there's a lot of good economic metrics out there. But when you poll Americans about, hey, is the economy doing good? Most Americans say no. Most Americans say, I'm struggling. We're struggling. What's going on? We need the economy to improve. So my question to you is, do you think we're in a good place economically? Um, and if so, why do you think the, the, the imp impression of the economy is what it is? Sure. So John, first of all, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here, uh, to get right to the heart of what you just brought up. I would say, no, the economy is not going well for the 60% of Marylanders and Americans that live paycheck to paycheck. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you watch CNBC or Bloomberg or any one of these business shows, I, I know sometimes I cringe when they kind of say, oh, the economy is great and the consumer is strong. Listen, the top 10% are strong, right? Uh, and they continue to be strong. And regardless of what prices are, their earnings are enough that, you know, it's uh, it makes a dent in their lives as opposed to uh, a smackdown for regular people, right? When you're mm -hmm. thinking that the average uh, person makes 30,000 a year, dual income household 60,000 a year, that does not get you very far in America today. And it's, I think, one of the reasons why, regardless of the fact that Joe Biden's a great person and he's a very good president, uh, the reason why Donald uh, um, Trump is doing so well in the polls, it's it's a, a, a phrase, I can't remember who said it, how long ago, but it's the economy, stupid. People mm -hmm. vote their paychecks. And by that measure, the next election is going to be tenuous if things continue the way they are. I, I couldn't agree more, Juan. And one of the things that I often say is that Democrats punt on the economy for no reason. There is so much positive economic data that supports policies like universal health care being the best thing for our economy, like relaxed immigration policy being good for our economy. Um, you, you, the, the list goes on and on, and I have my favorites. But if we discover, if you got elected to the U.S. Senate, and we discovered this weird hidden clause of the Constitution that says the senator from Maryland gets to implement one law, what would it be? The one law would be a uh, wealth tax, uh, and I'll make one be an increase in the inheritance tax. So what you have is a massive transfer of wealth. I used to quote 25 million, but I'm reading some books now, right? I like to be, uh, you know, under promise and over deliver. $50 trillion over the last 40 years has gone from the middle class to the top 1%, not the top 10%, the top 1%. And when you put that into dollars, it's something like the average worker, instead of making 30,000 a year, if that wealth had not gone into you know, fat cat shareholder pockets, the average wage in this country would be $57,000 a year. Now we're talking dual income of over a hundred grand. It's a different America. So Democrats by and large have let Republicans co-opt the words freedom and democracy. For us to have freedom and a strong democracy, we need to have a vibrant, growing middle class. And when we have a vibrant growing middle class like we did in the 50s, it's economic prosperity for everyone. The top 10% and the top 1% do even better than they're doing now, but we've got to we've got to bring a lot of that wealth back. And we can talk about some of the ways to do that. So wealth tax is number one um, and estate tax is number two. So people forget that 
40 years ago, even as late as the 1980s, the top marginal tax rate was 90%, right? Now it's 39%. So when we say, oh, wow, we don't have, we can only service the debt and the military and like, you know, social security and Medicare, and there's not any money for anything else. Well, th that's because the money's gone. And unless we tax the top 1%, their fair share, we cannot pay for the things that we want to do. And I dare say that's the greatest uh, threat to our democracy is a growing discontent in working class people. Yeah. And I think that you really hit the nail on the head there, especially when talking about how the wealth has been redistrib redistributed throughout you know, your lifetime and my lifetime and most of living Americans' lifetime. We've seen wages stagnate productivity increase and all that extra money going to the 1%, um, which is why we're seeing what I believe to be a K-shaped recovery in the economy right now, where the ultra wealthy are doing pretty darn good. And it's the rest of us who are kind of struggling to get by. And, you know, you, the, the thing to me, I think that is the problem with the perception of the economy is that as much as you can tell a you know a mother who's trying to put food on food on the table for a kid that unemployment's at at a low rate and that inflation's coming down that's not going to help her put that food on the table and no. when she sees the you know the ultra wealthy going bonkers right now that wealth inequality creates resentment you see it in you know in monkeys you know they've done tests on just people in general and you know want to be like their neighbor more than they want to just be wealthier. So to me, the entire concept of like all the money goes to the winners and the most successful people, like A, that's not necessarily the best way to do it. And B, it just makes everyone miserable. And to me, that's the biggest explanation for this disconnect that we're seeing between, you know, the the economists, um, the the media elites who like are looking at the graphs and the people who are actually living it. Um yeah. I I like the, that you mentioned the wealth tax. I would totally support that. I'm going to throw something out there and say, I would love to use a wealth tax to fund something like a universal basic income. Is that something that you would be interested in as a as a senator in, in yes. the long-term or short-term future? Yes. So uh, if we were to implement a um, combination wealth tax, estate tax, uh, and it would not be it would not be um, decap not decapitate, not the right. It would not be um, so detrimental to the top one percent that they would be fleeing the country, right? Yeah, um, we're talking punitive. about two, two, two percent, four percent, depending on the level of net worth. We could generate ten trillion dollars um, over the next ten years, so a trillion dollars a year that could go to universal uh, child allowance. It could mm -hmm. go to a basic income. It could go to creating free public education uh, in state and local colleges. It could go towards paid family leave. The, the The money's there, right? And what happens when you do that, when you start putting money back into people's pockets, you start leveling the playing field of fairness, right? For a long time, we've been focused on social inequality. Yeah, social inequality absolutely exists and, and we have a long way to go. But when you create more income equality, some of those issues start to lessen, right? And mm -hmm. when people don't have to worry at the end of the month about paying the electric bill or putting good food on the table for their children, that's where we need to get to. When 10% of children in America and in Maryland are food insecure, that's just wrong in this country, mm -hmm. right? When... Um, when people can hardly afford to, when they have to work three jobs and 60, 70, 80 hours a week, it, it, it's no wonder that they're killing themselves that, you know what, maybe I'll make a little less and I'll just, you know, get some money from the government because we disincentivize working when it's 15 bucks an hour. That's, that's not uh, a living wage, that's poverty wages. Exactly. And when you're so taxed of just trying to make ends meet, you're not doing the things that are actually going to be productive to society. If you, if you, you know, if you're working a second part-time job, just to put food on the table at McDonald's. Yeah. You're doing, you're doing, you're doing a job. You're, you're being productive. You're servicing society, but I'd be willing to bet that you'd be doing more for this country by staying home and playing with your kid and making sure that they, they develop themselves. Well, having sure. the freedom to 
choose what you need to do in your life to 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 help your community. Um, I think we have, as you mentioned earlier, I think you put it quite nicely how a lot of times Democrats have punted the term freedom over the Republicans and let them have it when in reality, I, sw- <laughs> I swear I feel much less free because of what, you know, um, the private corporations make me do than the taxes that I pay. Yeah. Um, and, so, and, yeah. yeah. L- l- let's talk about that. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, in the 40s and 50s, when we had that vibrant middle class, um, you had people, you know, they, they work nine to five, eight to five, 40 hours a week. And they could keep a roof over there. They they own their own home in many mm-hmm. cases, right? Um, wouldn't that be and, nice? Wouldn't that be nice, right? And um, if you want to work 60, 70, 80 hours a week and start a company and and, and do all that, absolutely. And sh- you should be rewarded that, uh, for that. But we shouldn't be penalizing regular people for wanting to, as you mentioned, just have uh, a nice lifestyle with the basics uh, taken care of with not having to worry about, hey, do I go to the doctor? Does that put us in medical debt? And the CEO compensation and greed on Wall Street are two of the reasons why we don't have it, right? So that 25% of the economy that is geared towards large corporations, using today's dollars, right? Back in the 1950s, the average worker made 30 grand a year, average CEO made 600,000 a year. Today, same average worker making 30,000 a year. What do you think the average CEO comp is? It's way, way higher than that. That's for sure. Give me a, give me a guess. $300,000 a year. $10 million a year. No way. I was trying to be like conservative. <laughs> 10 million. It's, it's like a, it's like a 400 to one uh, gap. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, and that's all at the expense of the workers. And that's just not the only person, right? You've got everyone in the C-suite. You've got all the senior vice presidents. Everyone's doing well. And the people that are delivering for that company aren't uh, you know, aren't being rewarded. And that's, that's where things have to change. You go back to that McDonald's worker or any service worker. We're a service economy now. Why mm-hmm. aren't the service jobs worthy of you know, a, a $26, $27 an hour living wage? Because that's what our economy is. So let's pay that. And you're seeing now with the UAW, with the Teamsters and other um, uh, uh, other union, uh, you know, kind of demanding their fair share. I think we're moving in that direction pretty quickly. Yeah. And, and you brought up a really good thing that hot labor summer has kind of moved into the winter. And we're seeing more union members, membership increasing in unions more than any time in my lifetime uh yep. we're seeing more union uh, organized labor action and in my opinion we're seeing more effective organized labor uh action because it seems like they're finally really fighting for the working class together i feel like for a while there unions and private interests kind of had a handshake agreement to just let business as usual operate and that seems to be coming to an end. It seems like working class people are more and more standing up and standing together in order to fight for our piece of the pie. What would you say you could do as a senator to enable you know those unions uh, to and and just the working class in general to you know help stand up for themselves and and, and get what they deserve? Sure. Um, you know, the, gosh. Uh... There was a movie not too long ago on Amazon Prime, Americond, Americond. Mm-hmm. You, 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 you know, I, I'd encourage everyone to watch it. So what we could do as elected representatives is make it easier for workers to unionize. Right now, you know, once a company or once many companies smell the hint of unionization, sometimes they fire the uh, union leaders and there's no, or the potential mm-hmm. uh, leaders that, that that rally other workers. There's very little repercussion. You'll see that in with Amazon and the movie Americond. And um, Microsoft, interestingly enough, has a handshake agreement, I think now with uh, unions to have them have a seat at the table with respect to AI. And as they continue to automate things, they will let their workers know ahead of time. and. Microsoft actually worked with uh, union leaders to say, hey, we're going to make it easier for people to form unions at Microsoft if that's ultimately what the workers want. So I think Congress needs to enable 
working class people to be able to unionize at Starbucks, at uh, Amazon, and any other place in order to bring that 25% of the economy to a living wage. I've, I've long said that unionization is one of the things that doesn't make sense that Republicans oppose. Because unionization, and in its most basic form, is just free market economics. It's just people banding together, <clears throat> sorry, using their leverage to negotiate a fair market value price. And without that, you know what happens? You get below fair market value yeah. prices. You get poverty wages. Yeah, exactly. A hundred percent. And yep. so I support any, you know, uh, legislation which gives more power to to the working class to be able to negotiate because even with all of the help in the world, this, the odds are always going to be stacked against us when we're when we're fighting against billion dollar corporations. You know, you bring up a great point, John, there, it, which is, you know, we have this mentality in America. And I think it might have been right in the in the 60s and the 70s and the 50s is, hey, you pull yourself from your bootstraps, you work hard and you can capture your fair of your, your fair share of the American dream. Right. The mm -hmm. challenge that we have, particularly in cities in areas where people have been left behind, if you if we want to be honest, they don't have boots, right? So when I hear some of my friends say, oh, people just have to pull themselves up. Well, you know what? These people don't have boots, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to at least give them the opportunity to purchase some boots so they can pull themselves up by the bootstrap. Yeah, no, and, and speaking of the people who are least likely to have the boots, I mean, physically, I hope they had boots because they probably did a lot of walking to come here. But, you know, in the metaphor, some of our, uh, you know, most at-risk people are immigrants, are new yep. immigrants, are, are 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 people seeking asylum here. And I know that has been a very hot button topic in the news recently. Now, it's one of my favorite topics to talk about is immigration. Um, but I'd love to hear you know, what how do you feel like we should treat immigration as a country? And how do you feel like that plays into the economic factors we've been talking about here so far? Yeah, you know, so the one of the false narratives that people believe is that we're going to build some type of impenetrable border. It's it's just not going to happen, right? Um, we've spent billions and billions of dollars and people still are piling through every day, right? Mm -hmm. It's a combination of items. We need to do a better job at public relations to tell the uh, potential immigrants that aren't here yet that... Um, there needs to be actual, the actual threat of personal harm in order to seek asylum, right? Because that's mm -hmm. number one. Not everyone that comes here has that, and that clogs up the court systems. And if we're able to hire the estimated 700, 700 judges that we need in order to adjudicate cases at the border more quickly, um, then we can figure out who truly deserves asylum, expedite the process to get them in here legally, um, and then allow them to quickly become taxpaying members and productive members of society, right? Because mm -hmm. folks that come here want a better life. They're fully capable in most cases to work. We need workers in places that frankly, your average American doesn't want to, doesn't want to go backbreaking farm work and other, you know, uh, types of, of, of labor and restaurant and dish cleaning and all, all these very difficult jobs, we need more people. And in fact, when you have a strong working class base, it ultimately ends up being better for your economy. Now they're making money. Now they're paying into the system. And we need them to pay in the system because if you believe that healthcare is a human right and um, something that gives everyone dignity like I do, well, then if they're here, you need to you, you need to provide them with health care and that costs money. And if they're not being productive and paying into the system, it costs folks like me and you even more money. I, I've always said that it's stupid to spend billions of dollars to keep people out of this country who, on average, pay more taxes than they consume in benefits. It's just yep. basic. You don't have to be an econ major to understand the the, the, the finance 101 of that situation and not to mention their kids who i don't know if anyone's ever met the kid of an immigrant but they tend to be really darn hard workers and and are already assimilated into america and it's just like i'd rather that kid be here and, yep. and, and working here and paying taxes now part, go ahead no i was gonna say part of it is fear and part of it is if we're being honest that um you know some republicans feel that oh 
if we let these folks in, they're going to be Democrats. And if they're Democrats, we're going to lose more seats in the House and the Senate, mm -hmm. whatever it is, which, you know, I got to tell you, uh, many of these folks fall into the Republican camp, sometimes just from a religious perspective. Right. So mm -hmm. it's another it's another false narrative. Listen, we do have to get our border situation under control. We do have to work with our neighbors to the south. In many cases, we have um, precipitated the result of what's happened by our, you know, uh, uh, funding and supporting dictators and things of that nature in C Central America and mm -hmm. creating this climate of bribery and drug culture and all these other things. Uh, in many cases, we brought this on ourselves. So we need to find a way to adjudicate more quickly at the border, get people in into a productive uh, state as quickly as possible and figure out, hey, how do we work with our neighbors to the south to help bring some law and order to those countries so that people don't feel the need to leave. Yeah. So I'm going to throw a curveball at you here since you brought up the, you know, the the ways in which drugs often destabilize countries in, in South America. I've long been a proponent of drug legalization here in America for one of the reasons being that if we legalize drugs, the cartels no longer have anyone to sell to because they'll be competing with Purdue and they're not going to win that battle. So what, what what would you say about, you know, I, I, you can start with the easy one of, of marijuana legalization, but would you go farther than that? Uh, first of all, I prefer a split finger fastball. It's a little easier to hit. Than, ah, well, than the, I, can, than, I don't than, got that in my arsenal, man. So. Than the curveball. <laughs> um, I would say that by every indication, legalizing marijuana has not led to the, hey, it's a gateway drug and people are going to do more drugs and things of that nature. Let's let's say what hasn't worked. What hasn't worked is our take on how to reduce the drug culture over the last 20 or 30 years. There's been all sorts of, you know, different takes on that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, God, what was Nancy Reagan's um, just, you know, don't, just don't do no. it. Yeah, just say just, no, just say right? No, yeah. There's been all sorts of um, different takes on it. And I think we do have to look more seriously at legalizing certain other uh, drugs like they do in Amsterdam, like they do in Portugal, because a lot of the studies show that it does not increase um, the danger to a greater percentage of people than already take them. To your point, it takes the profit motive out of it you take the profit motive out of it, you're taking the violence out of it. If you're taking the violence out of it and you have warning labels and all these other things, you don't have people taking some of these new drugs that, you know, kill them the first time they do. Them. Yeah. And and to me, I think it's uh, you can look back to American history and go, hey, uh, prohibition, we know that didn't work. And how did we get off of cigarettes as a country? Oh, we it was legal, but we regulated, we taxed, we put warning labels, we did all this, and it worked. And I think the same can be said for a lot of drugs out there. Yeah, um, not, I, I, really, I really like that answer. Yeah, and, and I think um, that that's one where you could absolutely bring the medical community in uh, to help um, mm -hmm. to help provide the that it needs to be a data driven exercise as opposed to, you know, hypotheticals and, you know, things of that nature. But I think if you, if you looked at the data and you looked at some of the places where it's been done before, there's no proof that it has increased drug use and it has to the points that we've uh, talked about um, gotten the profit motive out of it and gotten the violence out of it. And, and those are a couple of things that we need to do. Yeah. Oh, and you, you, you brought up healthcare there and you mentioned it earlier too. So I'm going to just do a really, really sharp and fast segue into universal health care, something that yep. I always talk about. We talk about a lot on this show. Would you uh, you know, support a bill uh, that, that that gave us universal health care? Yes. So uh, I believe there's 25 million or so Americans that are not insured or underinsured. And that just shouldn't happen. We should take the best of the models in Europe, in Canada, and start bringing it to this country. And by that, I mean that um, it doesn't cost more. That's one of the things that people say, oh, well, it's going to raise everyone's taxes. Now it might, it might, but you would have more than an offset on all of the deductibles and the monthly amounts that people pay, right? At the end of the day, even if you have quote unquote, good healthcare, 
you probably pay at least six to seven thousand, if not more, out of pocket every year. So mm -hmm. you might have a little bit of increase in your taxes, but it's not going to be six or seven thousand dollars. There's just too much duplication, too much administration, not enough people in the risk pool, which means that your procedure might cost 10 times what my procedure costs, which means that the drugs that you're getting might be five times the cost of what I'm getting. I, I remember there was a congressman on YouTube not too long ago, and he showed an example of six different people going to the pharmacy for the same drug, and they each paid different prices from like six bucks to over $100 for the same prescription, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because of the, all the different coverages. When you speak to doctors, they will say two things. One, there's plenty of money in the system. In fact, you can give universal health care to every American and save about a trillion dollars a year. If you say that it's five trillion dollars a year, roughly, uh, for health care in this country. The second thing that they say is it would make them easier to be doctors. I spoke to one doctor. They were on the Maryland, Pennsylvania border. And she said, Juan, you know what? I got relicensed. I moved over the border and I practice uh medicine in Pennsylvania, because when one of my patients needs a certain procedure or a certain test, and we don't do it in our hospital, in Pennsylvania, I can spend 20 minutes on the phone and I'll find someone to send them to, to go take that procedure. I might spend the entire day in Maryland because if it's not conducive for that facility, it's not price effective for them to do a procedure. They'll say, no, we can't, we can't take that patient. That's yeah. ins insanity. It, it makes a lot of sense. Why why are we wasting all this time with our doctors handling insurance questions when they- That's right. Doctoring. Doctors should, be, <laughs> doctors should be doctoring. I like that. Yes, 100%. No, I, I definitely like that. And as a, as a Pennsylvanian, I will say that, you know, it, maybe Maryland's more difficult, but Pennsylvania ain't no uh, walk in the park either. Uh, so. This was one doctor's perspective. But yeah, it's, not, <laughs> it's not a walk in the park anywhere. Exactly. I remember, you know, I know that the uh, vaccine- you know, had a bunch of political implications, but I think that everyone who got the vaccine, uh, that, that at least I know, were shocked by how easy it was to just go to a place and get uh, get medication uh, without needing to fill out 13 insurance forms. And yep. that could be our life. Um, that's if, that's if, right. If we just it, make it. Yeah. And, you know, when you talk about it, we got to be honest, right? The, the, so the downside is a little bit of inconvenience, right? Uh, someone would say you might um, you might wait longer for a procedure that's not life-threatening. Well, you know what? That's okay. The, the what, what folks in Europe say is the good thing about that is rich people have to wait um, just as long as poor people, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, th there's a fairness to that system. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, so let's uh, kind of start to wrap this up here. I'm very interested to know, we talked about a lot of policies here that obviously that you care a lot about us, you wouldn't be spending your time running for Senate, which seems like a daunting task to me. I'm not going to lie. What made you want to take this on? Like what, what, so, what, what was the origin yeah. story of Juan Dominguez? Let's talk about what made me take it on. And we definitely got to uh, do a little behind the scenes look for you. Cause I think people will be shocked. Mm -hmm. um, so what made me want to do it is um, 30 years ago, and it seems like another lifetime ago, I was a councilman in my hometown from 1996 to 1998 ran for a higher office, lost. And then, you know, I got married. I had children. I started a, you know, a business career really. And, um, you know, like anybody else, we talk about what's working, what's not working in the country. We all have an opinion, right? And now I'm 56 and I'm like, you know, if I'm going to do something about it, uh, it, it's probably about the right time, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm not getting any younger. And at first, John, it was about, you know, uh, making things better and, you know, making things more bipartisan and stopping the gridlock, really kind of very general. Mm -hmm. And as I really got into this, and I would say over the last 90 days, when we launched our campaign on September 6th, the lightning bolt that hit me was the fairness piece, right? That there is a large group of people that have been left behind or feel like they've left behind. And that's not the America that I grew up in. So when I talk about those three key things that we talked about, right, income inequality, uh, closing uh, the the gap, the, the wage gap, uh, providing health care for all, and uh, a debt-free college experience uh, to the extent possible in state schools, those are things worth fighting for for me. Those are things worth me having to leave my job. And that's if we just segue quickly into what's fair, what's unfair about the system. Listen, I'm a positive guy, and I will, I'm going to fight the good fight. 
but I will tell America that the system is rigged. It, it is. The system is rigged for the soccer parent that wants to go out and make change that is just as good as a politician, a career politician for the uh, doctor that has a practice in town, for the person that's active in the PTA. Most people can't do what I did. Um, and they're not going to win if they do it part time for any federal office. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have reduced running for Congress is basically a rich person or a career politician that has done the stepping stone from local to state, you know, to state legislature to because they have the establishment backing and very quickly they force the outsiders uh, out or to the back bench. So we're proud that we have been able to force our way into the debate stage to raise enough money to at least do that. But it is absolutely daunting task. And that's why we need campaign finance reform, because I want to see regular Americans that are coaches like I am uh, for their kids that are involved in the PTA, that have great and, and who just want to make things better. They should have just as much opportunity to run as the millionaires, billionaires and career politicians. I think that's that's what campaign reform can bring to this country. I, I could not agree more. I, I, I'm one of those people who would love to run for, for office at some point in my life, but financially, it just ain't happening right now. Um, and so I guess a lot of my, a lot of our audience probably feels similarly. I, not all of them, not everyone wants to be a politician, but all of them are politically active in, and involved in these communities. And probably some of them wish to be where you are one day. So I'd love to give us a little peek behind the curtain, you know, t t tell us if if we plan on running for Congress, what should sure. we expect that like we aren't going to expect? Uh, so first, I'll give uh, some quick advice for whoever wants it is get involved locally with your Democratic Party, your Republican Party, your independent uh, party, uh, because there is always the need for volunteers. And that's how, you know, that's how you make a name for yourself by helping out on campaigns. And then ultimately you can run to be a central committee person, which is what they call, you know, the folks in each of our communities and our counties that have a say in the primaries and debates and things of that nature. Um, what, what you don't know is particularly in a statewide race that you have to raise a boatload of money, right? And the way you raise a boatload of money is I make three to four hours of calls at least every day, Monday through Saturday. I have a, a dialer, which makes it a little bit easier, but that's what you're doing. You're cold calling for money. You have a script. The less scripted you sound, the better chance you have. Uh, it's good that I had a sales background for many years, but it's just call after call, putting it in the uh, um, uh, in the database, following up with people because there's very few people that uh, that give the first go around. But it's interesting that some do. I mean, they'll actually give you their credit card for you to pull in. It's it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Once they see your website on a URL, some people are like, oh, I don't go to Act Blue. You do it for me. Um, so that's interesting. And then, you know, I think the most rewarding part and the part I wish I could do more, and I'm hoping after January 1st to do more of it, is going out and meeting and talking to people. That's where the rubber really meets the road. And with campaign finance reform, that would allow people to talk to people. A, they get good ideas. B, they see firsthand how they're suffering. Um, little things that you don't even think of, right? When you're out there having to put air in your tires, right? If you're on minimum wage, it's two bucks to put air in your tire at the gas station. You know, mm -hmm. maybe we should make air free and just give the people that own the gas stations a little, a little state, you know, royalty or something, because mm -hmm. it's little things like that throughout the course of the day that add up. Yeah. My, my local Wawa gives us our air for free. So I'm very, that's pretty <laughs> sweet. <laughs> I'm gonna um, have to get their address after this. Uh, I'll write. I'll send it. To you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it maybe you won't, you'll make one less call because of that's it. right. <laughs> um, no. So th thank you very much for coming on, Juan. It's it's been a pleasure to have you. Pleasure to hear what you know what your thoughts are on how to fix the issues that are facing America right now. And I'll just give you an open, uh, you know, uh, mic here to just whatever message you want to leave to our audience and sure. let them with. Go I would say. I, I would say if you have the opportunity to get involved in your community, uh, do so. Because at whatever level, it's the most rewarding work. I, I have uh, basketball practice with my son tonight. His his vote 
in order to, you know, can dad run or not? Because everyone had a vote in our family, our two boys and my wife. And he was like, dad, you can run for whatever you want, but you still have to coach my baseball and my basketball team. And I think I've missed a practice, right? Mm -hmm. So I prioritize that around everything else, because I got to tell you, the three funnest hours of the week are the two hours that we practice basketball twice a week and the game on Saturday. It's a blast watching these kids, you know, get better. So it's kind of the same thing. I would say that I got involved to make the lives of working class people in my state and in America better. Because when we have a strong middle class, when our economy grows from the middle out, as opposed to top down, trickle down economics, it makes for a stronger state. It makes for a stronger America. It makes for um, a safer democracy and it protects all of our freedoms. So that's why I'm running. My website is uh, juanformaryland.com. You could follow us on any social at Juan for Maryland. And, uh, you know, it's been the uh, the pleasure of a lifetime, this first bit of the journey. And I'm looking forward to the next five months uh, before the primary.